Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in and listening from to this week's Lifestyle Pirates. It's been a while since we've been here and live with you guys. It's been good to get back. Um, the dread of COVID is still around. We've got lots going on and we have a very exciting guest on this week's episode. You're with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. Oh, thanks, man. Did you forget your name? Yeah, I did a little bit. Well, that's why it's we tattooed go. on my arm. <laughs> very cool. Is it? Is oh, it really? Surname is. Surname. Good stay. Good stay. Oh, not sermon. This episode, <laughs> you wish. This episode, we've got Malcolm Ald, who is a marketing man of many hats. He's actually wearing one this evening if you're tuning in on YouTube. Mate, welcome to Lifestyle Thank Pirates. Thanks for having me. Nice to be here. I should have said, ah, it's nice to be here, shouldn't I? But that's a bit obvious. Yeah. Yeah, you wouldn't be the first one to actually <laughs> no, do that's that. What I said. That's bit, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't be. No. We, we actually had um, our last one of our last guests, a guy called Tom Nash, uh, who an actual uh, pirate who has uh, hooks as hands. Yes. Oh um, wow! He actually said that he came in as fancy dress as, as a pirate. So uh, mm. yeah, that was yeah, uh, that a was great sense of humour. That guy. Um, <laughs> You'd mate, have to. you yeah. are. Uh, I said you're a man of many hats. You're a lecturer. Um, you've been in the marketing world a long, long time. You're an author. Um, you're a keynote speaker. You've been voted back more than most. Um, I was reading on your LinkedIn profile for some of the events as well. Yeah. Um, I looked up the definition of marketing. So for those of you that are tuning and listening, I love marketing. Um, for me, I actually studied at a university. My reason why was because every company needed marketing. And the girl I was seeing at the time, she was at the <laughs> university closest to me. So that was my why. Um, but the definition place. of marketing is the action or business of promotion and selling products or services, including market, or market research and advertising. How would you define it, Malcolm? Look, that's an academic you know, definition. My mind's very simple. Find out what people want and sell it to them profitably and you'll get rich. You know, uh, at the end of the day, <laughs> uh, sometimes they don't know what they want and you've, mm. got to, you've got to create it for them. No one really knew they wanted an Apple Watch, but Steve Jobs was able to convince people they did. That's fair. Mm. So, yeah, you got me. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's understanding the needs and wants of, of customers and, and delivering it in a way that's profitable by whatever channel or means. Yeah. Know. My lecturer um, referred to it as um, exploitation and bullshit. Yeah, he's probably close. Uh, but <laughs> it's a, the other thing I say, and, and more to business to business, is marketing creates the need, sales fulfills the need. Yeah. So marketing builds the desire, and if you need a sales team like in B2B, then it sets it up so that it's easier for the salesperson to sell. Yeah. Mm. And so how did you get into it? I was actually going to be a professional soccer player. Um, oh, yeah? But, uh, yeah, I was earning a few shekels in high school. Uh, I was going to go to uni and uh, we had a situation in Australia where education had suddenly become free. So you had all these deg degreed people but no jobs. Mm. I was told that I wouldn't get work unless I got work experience, which meant I went to night school, university mm. at night. Yeah. And the one thing I'd had to give up was three nights training, went back to amateur. So uh, I started, got a job and the job was in commodity trading and I was studying marketing and branding and they weren't connecting and so... Mm. I left there and moved across into retail and then eventually got a job in marketing and then moved to the agency side. So I've worked both sides. So I've run agencies, I've run marketing departments and startups and I've had my own email software business and I've had a travel agency, uh, retail supermarkets, so mm. sort of uh, lots of hands-on experience. All of that before <laughs> 21? Uh, 28, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what what was the the, the bit? The, there's, a, there's a beautiful quote um, by... I assume one of the chaps you worked with, David Ogilvy, saying that you've tasted blood. Yeah. Um, what was that bit that got you into it? Look, the I, I when I first got into marketing, I was studying it, I thought that there are all these bunch of really intelligent people understanding the psychology of consumer behaviour and writing persuasive messages based on that. And then I found out that was utter bullshit. <laughs> 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 it was just a lot of fun people working hard, partying in advertising agencies, yeah. you know, and, and having a good time. And I, I started in the uh, client side in marketing. You know, I was a marketing manager with TNT and building databases before that became popular. So I got into direct marketing very, very early. And because I did, see, I started by going to uni at night, I started work before I had was old enough to drink. I was, hadn't turned 18. Mm. So I had a job in management, and at 22 I was a national marketing manager. I've been working five years. Mm. So by the time I'm, you know, David Ogilvy, I ended up at 28, the youngest ever head of an office in Ogilvy worldwide. Wow. And I met David in um, Barcelona for the first time at a conference, and I had to come up and speak in front of everyone. He was sitting two people away, and his rule was he had to be 35 to run his agency, and everyone's, you know, the, the Europeans were smoking and everybody else was mumbling while I was setting up the flip chart, and he... He just goes, 
how old are you? And the whole place went dead silent because God had spoken. And mm. I thought, oh, I'm dead here. He's going to nail me on my age. So I just said, pardon me, and I bought some time. And he goes, how old are you? He inflected the old. Yeah. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. I said, listen, David, I've never even met you. How dare you ask me such a personal question? Just sit back. Let me do my presentation. We'll discuss my personal life afterwards. Well, there was an inhale of breath in the room because I just told David I <laughs> go to get stuffed. <laughs> and David leant forward and sat with his head on his hand, on his chin on his uh, hands yep. for the whole thing and applauded me as I walked off. And I sent him a note saying, I'm 28, not that it's any of your business. <laughs> and when he came, mates, off the back of that, he, he went and he bought me afternoon tea and said, Come and talk to me. You know, yeah. so. Wow. And that's so, awesome. Ballsy. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. for the people that would know this world or even who David Ogilvy is, um, give us some kind of frame of reference. Okay, famous ad, you know, Mad Men could have been written around David. Uh, he was a pioneer of um, very much, he came from market research. He didn't open his agency until he was nearly 40 and he'd worked in market research. So he understood the value of, of research and understand the consumer and also measurement. So he's a big direct response advertiser and he, he really, he grew his agency using direct mail, funnily enough, mm. to get business. And he was one of the pioneers of creative advertising in a certain way. Burnback was the big creative breakthrough in the 60s. Mm. But he, his book, Ogilvy on Advertising, is the Bible of the industry still. Uh, and the Ogilvy brand uh, is still one of the most highly regarded advertising brands in the world. Yeah. And it's one of those things, if you actually worked at Ogilvy, it would, to have met him was like <laughs> touching the hand of God. You know? mm, wow. It was worth a pay rise. And, and you just told this man to sit down and <laughs> yeah, shut up and exactly. let you present. Yeah, that's awesome. And we became good mates. And he invited me to his place. I went to dinner in Paris with him at his home and uh, I met him a few times uh, before he passed away. So I was very lucky. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, I want to give um, our listeners and viewers some context because you've just mentioned that you worked on the client side and the yeah. agency side. Yeah. Explain the nuance, because yeah, okay, we're going to I think refer to this quite a lot in, yeah. in this in this episode. Well, client side means you're running a marketing department, uh, and you have a budget to pay an agency to do the work for you, or maybe you don't, but generally you do. And so, as a marketing manager, you have people who work in marketing underneath you. As an agency, you're doing the marketing communications. Mm. The marketing department, though, you're looking at product or services where where they're placed, the distribution. You're working with sales teams, so it's a broader remit if you like but it survives on its marketing communications and its brand positioning and that's where the agencies are the experts in that and so I started on the client side then moved across because direct marketing was just taking off and I'd been doing it hands-on as a client so I actually had a lot of expertise for a young bloke and so Ogilvy asked me to, to move to Melbourne and run, work on Shell so I moved down there from Sydney and then went to the New York office and then back to Sydney. So the agency is the sort of the better job out of the two uh, rather than the client? Is there a better? Is that Historically, a yes. The mm. agencies were more fun, better paid, yeah. uh, more outrageous in the days where you could be. Yeah. Uh, but what's happened now is the marketing departments have got funky and offices now have had to come up with better quality environments mm. with bars and food or, you know, just better work environments than little, you know, little offices or, or um, cubicles. Because one of the reasons I went to the agencies was they were full of these crazy people, half of whom were probably smoking dope, you know, at lunchtime. Mm. Um, <laughs> you know, and they're all young and they all work hard and they play hard. And then, so it was a more interesting thing to leave your marketing office than come to the agency office because they were just designed differently. And people were having fun and stuff. Yeah, they were enjoying their work, yeah. What sort of a job is that? <laughs> <laughs> Go to work and actually have fun? <laughs> I didn't yeah. have a, he's, he had a bar at his work. Do you even know mm. what marketing is? Mm. Not a, well, not in a, fact, no, the, no, no, no. you've got a coffee machine at your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, a, not a bar. Like, the not like the a Ogilvy bar, bar the Singleton's had a great bar, Mojo had a great bar, but the Ogilvy bar in North Sydney, even competitors would come on a Friday night to drink at our place, oh, yeah, right? rather than the rag and famish, you know. <laughs> and then, then they go yeah, to the yeah, rag yeah. and famish afterwards, you know. So it was just one of those places where young people went wild because they work long hours and, mm. and there's deadline pressure all the time, you know. I mean... You look at why newspaper guys used to look so old and decrepit because they smoke and drank for deadlines, you know, and the agency business was the same. Yeah. So am I right in thinking you, you had more creative rope, for want of a better way yes. of putting it, at an agency than you would do perhaps working under the, the, the company banner? Absolutely, because the creative tended to come out of agencies that didn't come from the client. That doesn't mean marketing people aren't creative, but their role was to brief the agency who did the creative work. Mm. Sometimes clients would come up with the ideas and brief them, but that, that wasn't the division of labour, mm. and it still isn't generally. Mm. Uh, usually it's still the agencies that develop the creative. Yeah. Mm. So you, and, and again, mm. I want to just give a kind of 
because what we're going to talk about is it's a timeline thing and we're kind of coming yep. back i think yep. from previous conversations we've had so you mentioned direct marketing um what what era was that what time was that? okay that's the 80s uh, so going the into 80s the 90s and, and direct marketing is well one of my definitions with drayton bird who's a famous marketer is it's the art of losing money in very small amounts you know so that you can make money in lots of amount by testing and learning you know and, and direct marketing is a way of marketing. So it's where you deal directly with an individual or they spawn, respond directly to you. Mm-hmm. And there's always an exchange of either dollars or data. So in other words, give me your email address, we'll give you a newsletter. Give me a credit card, we'll give you a case of wine. You know, so, and everything online is direct. But because that seemed old-fashioned, because mail is one of the channels, mm-hmm. they changed the term to digital marketing when, in fact, all digital marketing is direct marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that databases were taking off uh, variable data printing where you personalised print started in the 80s. It's not new because of the internet. It's always been there. Yeah. Like on the cover of the book, that's not that new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, having personalised mail. I mean, there was a farm journal that used to personalise half of its content. I mean, if you're a pig farmer, you don't want to know what's happening with wheat farming. So they would half the content would be dedicated to the type of farm you were. Mm. And the other content was general content, you know, and that was 30 years ago. And so what industries are you working in then in the 80s? So we're talking FMCG? Uh, FMCG went big, uh, except for baby clubs and and things like that, but it was automotive was big. Financial services pioneered direct marketing. Amex was our biggest client around the world. Mm. Um, In fact, Ogilvy Direct opened up offices on the back of Amex opening up offices. Wow. Uh, So financial services is big. Automotive was big. Business to business was big because it was data-driven databases. uh, And we started with fast-moving consumer goods, but it's a different type of purchase process. You know, with, with FMCG, uh, it was pre-internet. It was it was almost cost not cost-effective to be mailing and building databases because it just cost too much for the the margins on the products. Yeah. Uh, and one the thing with FMCG, you're into a lot of habit there, and it's very hard to change mm. what tomato sauce you're going to buy or what toilet paper you're going to buy. You yeah. know, but. If you're, if you're selling photocopiers or if you're selling software or if you're selling cars, you know, there's usually an itch cycle linked to a lease or a turnover time. So being in touch with them and knowing when that is, you can really bring the direct marketing skills to the fore. You know? um, and what was the area that you like to kind of hang out in? Um, oh, the other one was travel, actually. Uh, in fact, we used to pre-sell P&O. We would sell 25% of their bookings with one mailing in what's called the wave, which happens in the first quarter of the year. Uh, so I d- enjoyed travel. I loved automotive. Uh, yeah. Financial services can be fun. Most people think it isn't, but you can turn it into fun. But, you know, B2B, business to business, I love, because you can go through a door. Yeah. Mm. So the creative can be a 3D pack, you yeah. know. And we've actually caused building evacuations, which wasn't a good thing, but um, <laughs> we had a laser gun selling a laser printer and X-ray machines saw the laser gun, so panic ensued. Um <laughs> <laughs> Look, at least there's a call to action. They're <laughs> yeah, either going to call right. you to go with the whole yeah. WTF or yeah. Yeah. they're going to say well, that was a great campaign. Yeah, well, the uh, the, the head of um, the wheat board rang me up and told me what to do with the laser gun. Because <laughs> 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 de- they dealt with Iraq and Iran and Israel and, you know, so right, they right. didn't think it was yeah. a very smart move and in hindsight it wasn't. But, yeah. You know, it's a story. So over the years you would have seen mm. – some real changes in in not maybe the theory of marketing i guess in terms of the method mm. um um how that's implemented i guess the outcomes and then perhaps how they're manipulated and and our behaviors of influence as a consumer do you want to talk to any of that yeah i think look people have always bought emotionally and they justify rationally I mean, there is no other reason for Jimmy Choose. Why no woman wants to teeter on six-inch heels? Yeah. Mm. Say but, that again, because that's such a good point. Or they buy emotionally and yep. justify rationally, yep. right? The reason a forty-year-old buys a sports car, male, is he'll tell you it's because he's got cup holders and it goes from naught to one hundred in point two seconds, and it's got three wheels, or whatever it is. The real reason is sitting at the lights. He thinks he's God when he takes off, and everyone's looking at him. You know, like it's it's, it's emotional but justified rationally. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. No. <laughs> 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 and uh, so the reasons for, for buying have not changed. The technology we use has changed. If you look at behaviour, the one thing that has influenced behaviour, though, is, is the mobile device. Mm. That has certainly quickly changed because it takes thousands of years for the brain to change. Mm. All, that's, all the phone's tapped into is dopamine effect, you know. Mm. Um, but 
we still have to need we still need emotional reasons and we need social proof. Um, and this is where a lot of the internet's failed in that they talk about micro targeting. Well, if I've got if I've got a micro targeted ad to me about some cool new craft beer that no one's ever heard of and I turn up to the party on the weekend and bring my cool new craft beer that no one's heard of, it sits untouched mm. in the ice bucket. But if I've got the cool new craft beer that everyone's talking about and I turn up with it, I'll be lucky to get one of the six-pack, right, because mm. everyone will want some. So the micro-targeting is BS unless you're building brands and people know what the brand is because they want to know that other people are buying the same thing. Mm. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that. I, there was... Oh. I'm going to go maybe six years ago, six, maybe six, maybe seven, um, when growlers were really yep. just starting to come in from all the craft breweries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I used to rock up to pre-drinks or friends with a growler. Mm-hmm. And it was actually of Young Henry's. Right. Um, and everyone was like, whoa, what's that? Yeah. Um, now, a growler for people in the UK <laughs> is not <laughs> a bottle. It's it's something very different. And I'll let you Google it. Um, but people, would, there was that curiosity yeah, but I would then I would then get a drop of my beer. Mm. Yeah, because a growler basically held a six pack. That's right. Yeah, and so your point about social proof, I used to walk in like I meant it. Yeah, and own the place with mm. this couple of growlers. Yeah, 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 uh, and that that's the distribution channel there that's working for mm. you, which is the growler. But mm. but so what uh, so what you've seen is as data became available, which really started in the eighties, because the big change was mainframes moving to desktop and distributed networks where salespeople could manage contacts and then send it back to a central point so data changed in the sales process and the marketing process so you know data driven is not new it's always been data driven what's happened with the internet though is that we can measure everything doesn't mean we should we happen to do that but i think all it's done is created this thing called big data most of which is just in the marketing area all we've done is create a public service for marketing where pixel pushers create reports of people of their consumers and their touch points most of which have nothing to do with the sale at the end of the day. They're just nice to have things like someone liked a tweet or someone shared an Insta post. Mm. So what? You know, at the end of the day, it really doesn't. The, the, the marginal, it, there's no marginal increase in business as a result of measuring all this data. Yeah. So are you alluding to, um, let's say back in the day you did a DM campaign of a mail drop, uh-huh. and I'm going to use just a random number, let's say one in 100, you'd get a... A, a client or response, a yep. response. Yep. Are you saying that, that that data or those those responses are still fairly similar nowadays? But we have all this other noise around sharing and likes and click throughs and stuff. That, yeah, that doesn't actually result in business. That's right. There's a lot of vanity metrics that don't result in business, mm. but that's what's being tracked because they can, right? Mm. And because mail, for example, was seen as for somehow something that's old fashioned is regarded as bad. Mm. It's like. We've been breathing, but, you know, no one's saying that's old-fashioned, you know, for since the days of time. But yeah. everyone has a mailbox, everyone likes to receive mail, but it was ignored by a generation as they rushed to the... And, hey, I launched the first email marketing agency in Australia and I wrote one of the world's first books on it. So I was passionate about where email was going. This is this book here? No, the previous one to that okay. on email marketing. We'll come back to that. And that was 20 years ago. So I was passionate about what digital could do because I knew the power of direct mail and I was looking at what we could do with that mail to put it into email. Mm. But then social media turned up and everyone got distracted by what it could be and just because people are on there doesn't mean they want to have advertising on there even though they need it to survive. And what has happened now, it's called the, the greatest consumer protest in history. There's, there's estimated 2 billion people in the world have downloaded advertising blockers onto their digital Mm. devices that's in europe it's nearly half the population of some countries don't want advertising in the digital channels mm. and now you've got the third party cookie data and all this being you know coming to a halt yeah it's changing th- that you can't track people all around the net eventually and we're going to go back to where we were before the internet uh where you've just got to use your customer data and your prospect data and talk to them mm. more one-to-one in the proven channels because I saw research this week in, in September. The latest research shows that 40, 45% of people hate receiving unsolicited SMS messages mm-hmm. and 26% of people hate receiving, I don't trust, sorry, opt-in email. So they've opted in to receive it, but a quarter of the population don't trust it. Mm. Now, Optus just had that massive data breach, right? You know, nearly for those listening, it was nearly half the population. Yeah. Data got stolen by our second largest telco. Of Australia. In Australia, yeah. Uh, 
and serious data. I mean, you're talking people who haven't been customers for 15 years. Yeah. Had their data stolen. They they've been keeping identity data such as your password and your driver's license stuff they should never have kept. Mm. So what did Optus do? The first thing they did was they went to the trusted medium of newspapers and ran big ads. But then they went into email and SMS as their main channel to communicate, the least trusted channels. Yeah. At a time when all the scammers went in with Optus scam saying how to recover your data, yeah, scam, yeah. scam, scam. So all Optus did was perpetuate the negativity towards the brand yeah. because the scammers were in there at the same time. It took them over two weeks to write a letter to their customers. Yeah. Oh, right. So out of interest, to play devil's advocate, what would you have done in that situation? Um, from what I can tell, they took too long out of the gates. It would appear that the breach was well before they announced it. So the first thing you do is you you admit it, you know, and they fe- it, the body language felt like they were covering up mm. or avoiding, and that's the that's the worst thing you can do. Mm. And I would have sent out emails to all of them and said, hey, keep an eye on the letterbox and keep an eye on the newspapers, or we're going to run some TV or something like that. Or you, so I, I would have advised where the channels are going to be. Mm. But what I wouldn't have done, which is what they did, is make it a do-it-yourself. Come to our website and solve the problem yourself. You yeah. know, I would have hired very quickly a bunch of people onto phones because mm. the the waiting time was huge on the phones. Yeah. Uh, or you would have put more people in the shops at Optus and said, go to these store or whatever it might be. And I would have written them a personal letter. I mean, the letter came out, dear customer, yeah. and it was signed by the Optus team. I mean, what, there's 20 of them signing the letter? I mean, yeah. sign it from an individual. That's what it's a letter so is. It's a yeah. personal medium. Yeah. Don't sign it. from. It had the name of the person, but then it had dear customer, mm. not dear first name. Yeah, yeah. Signed, the Optus team. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like... Emails. No one, teams don't send emails. They're all sitting around waiting to hit the send button, <laughs> you know, with 10 one. index fingers <laughs> at once, you know. Um, it's a personal set. And the problem is you've got a generation who don't know that. And this is what the internet's done. You've got, they've all chased shiny digital objects. Yeah. So you've got a generation of chief marketing officers now, many of whom have never worked in the traditional proven media like TV and outdoor and, and mail. And they don't know what they don't know. And they're struggling now because as... These wall gardens are coming up because third-party data, you now, you know, you can now buy advertising within Uber's network, you can buy advertising in DoorDash's network or Deliveroo's, in Facebook's separate to uh, Apple's network. So you've got wall... So we're going back to the old days of dealing direct with publishers mm-hmm. because all these big brands are becoming publishers. Yeah. So things are changing now and you've got a whole generation of marketers who've never done that and don't know what to do and they're a bit rabbits in the headlight at the moment. How, how did we arrive at this um, greatest consumer protest? Because it, it's interesting. My theory on this is that if you look at Facebook as an example and use Facebook for all social, yeah. they said it's so easy, you don't need marketing skills, just 80 character headline, everyone's image is exactly the same size and X number of characters for the type, the, the copy that supports it. So all these people jumped on doing Facebook advertising very cheaply without ideas, just slapping in stock photos and headlines that didn't work. But because it was so cheap, it was a numbers game. They would just send, they would do thousands of ads in the hope that eventually they paid. So what happened was you had a generation who were being told by the platforms, you don't need to be a marketer to be a marketer. Mm -hmm. And some of them succeeded with startups. So they're suddenly saying, you don't need to be a marketer to be a marketer. And... Or they're calling themselves a marketer. Or they're calling themselves a marketer and they don't know what they're talking about. You know, I saw someone the other day, I was just... There's there's a there's a artificial intelligence, and there's a reason it's called artificial, but artificial intelligence <laughs> writing software, right? Mm. And the first headline I saw was a guy sitting in a car and the shot's taken from the dashboard looking up at him with his earphones in, his, his iPad things, earphones. Um, what do you call it? Earpods, sorry. And the headline says, this tool writes copy for you. Right? Well, if anyone knows what a tool is in oh, this country, it means a complete and utter idiot, right? <laughs> what they're trying to say was the software tool. Yeah. So that software is demonstrating that it doesn't work by writing a headline yeah. that says... Then the other one that came up was, this ad um, was written... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, a, uh, this ad was written by a robot and it's working. Well, the subject of the first sentence is this ad, not robot. So the second sentence implies to the subject that the ad isn't working mm. and it's been written by artificial intelligence. So it's trying to sell itself by demonstrating it's completely incompetent, right? And this is, it's just a metaphor for the digital marketing industry. All these people calling themselves marketers who aren't marketers. Mm. 
you know, I, I've never hired a digital marketer because they're not complete. Yeah, right. You know, like, and it's a channel definition, right? So, you know, you're all blokes, you know, when you go to the male loo in the public area in the airport, there's, there's ads above the urinals. Mm, yeah. Does anyone call themselves a urinal wall marketer because that's the channel? <laughs> like digital marketing's a channel. That's a you, nice title. You know, you don't go male urinal wall marketer or railway stair advertising marketer. You know, like it, it's not about the channel, but they call themselves channel marketers and mm. it, that's so limiting in what yeah. their expertise is. Yeah. And that's caused problems because that's their limit of expertise. And the world is now pushing back on digital. So let's go back to, because um, I'm, I'm conscious of, of who kind of tunes in, we mentioned cookies and I lick my lips, um, but we're not talking obviously about yeah. what we nibble. Mm. So walk people through that journey because I think we're all guilty of buying things online or having a little look online. Mm. You know, I know. I went to the McLaren website the other day. I thought I could get some Daniel Ricciardo hoodies half price, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden, whatever yeah. website I yeah. go on, bang, 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 I'm getting followed by that, which I don't mind. I like McLaren. But it's in my Gmail. Mm. It comes up on YouTube. Yep. Like maybe walk us through what that is. C- cookies were invented. It came from the term magic cookie, was the which was the the ability to transfer data backwards and forwards between computers. It was invented by Netscape, the first browser, and Netscape wanted to know if people coming to their websites had been there previously. Mm. And when it first happened, everyone's oh, this is a bit spooky. That's where it came from. But it evolved to much more, where the cookies linked across platforms. Mm. And the data was then sold so that you could be, you could you could want to target a person, and all the track that they've done, where they've been before, appears in that targeting. So it allows ads to appear in places you wouldn't expect, yeah. Teresa. So it's really, and to your point about remarketing, mm. I had a very dear friend in the '60s who was looking for a really cheap um, baby present for her niece, and she rang me and she said, "Malcolm, how do I stop this bloody stuff chasing me around the net?" I said, "What's up?" She said, "Look." I know I'm getting old and they're sagging, but I keep seeing nothing but ads for breast pumps. <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'm sick of seeing them, you know. And yeah. and that was because she was on sites looking for baby products. Right? Yeah. And and the, the, the worst part of this is you buy something and it doesn't link. So they keep chasing around the net when you've already bought it. And yeah. that's what and so what they're leaving cigarette burns on the arms of the prospects of the customers. It's yeah. so frustrating. Yeah, and so it damages mm. people. So I had actually had that experience and I was a customer. Mm. So um I bought some Step One boxes. Yep. So they're pretty cool. They're good boxes. Different different colours. Off television. Yeah. No. Off off TV. Yeah, off TV. Yeah, right. So yeah. I saw TV. Yeah. Um, so ordered them online. Got the whatever pack it was for whatever. Bought the order. Da, da, da. The next day in my inbox was not the only the order confirmation and that it's on the way. There was then another email saying, "Do you want to buy some of these?" Mm. And I was like, "I just I've just bought five pairs." Yeah. Yeah. I don't need another five no. pairs already. No. You know, maybe, well, if you're a bloke, maybe in two years' time, when, <laughs> <laughs> once you've turned them inside out. Five, five oh, down, yeah, maybe yeah, five years. They last yeah, a long yeah, time, yeah. those ones. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was like, something's going to miss that. And it was such yeah. a great experience mm. until then. And I was like, oh, you, you, you need to And that's because me. marketers have relied, they've gone to this marketing automation where they let the software, the, let's just program all these follow-ups without actually tracking the damage it's doing. Let's just look at the responses we're getting. And as it costs nothing, yeah. we only need one response and it's paid for itself rather than, oh, how many people have we lost because yeah. of doing it? You get paid per engagement as well sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. And everything. And, and, yeah. Like for me, if because I go on the internet quite a lot, um, if I go onto a web page and then bang straight away cookies and then you have to go in, I'll go, I'll, I'll leave the web page. Yeah. And then if I go into a web page as well and my whole, like all the real estate on the, on the browse on the page is completely filled with ads, I'll get out. I yeah. just, mate, I can't deal with it anymore. It no, absolutely no. kills me now. Yeah. No breast pumps though. No, 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 no other types of pumps, <laughs> bike pumps <laughs> for my push bike. Um, <laughs> So you mentioned before about this uh, this micro data and stuff like that. Mm. Is is it getting to a point now where if that micro data is not useful for marketing, or why are they collecting this data? Not only because they can, but can they use it later? Like, what's the point of this? And there's got to be uh, some sort of security breach in getting all of that data from people. Well, to answer your last question, yes, there is, and that's why the privacy laws are going to change. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of breaching around there, but. Mm. The other thing is because they can, and as I said before, there's this public service of pixel pushers who just do reports. Look at all this data yeah, we're collecting. Yeah. doesn't mean anything. I mean, if you look at the invest, the billions that have been invested in all these automated platforms, mm. 
all of those sales would have happened without any of that technology. Right, ninety percent of sales will happen without internet technology, without all that. The incremental mile to return for this business—they're they, just not paying for themselves. Mm. Yet everyone's investing because they think they need a customer data platform to pa- to track every point. But it's only the online points. Mm. And if you look at what forced us to shop online, it wasn't clever marketing. It was a friggin' pandemic, mm. right? And that caused the growth in online shopping. Mm. Now in America, it peaked at about eighteen percent of all sales online were of all retail sales were online sales and it's now declining the trend is up but it's declining from the peak of last year's covid because we we had to go online because we couldn't leave our homes Mm. so if you take amazon and walmart out of the american online sales online sales in america is about eight percent of all retail sales it's the kiddie pool of marketing right yet they're throwing money into this space And the only thing that got us there was a pandemic, not great marketing or good experience or good customer service online. So you've got this interesting thing that like in Australia, I, I did a post on this, I had a photo of Kmart at midnight on the day lockdown was opened. There was hundreds of people, hundreds of metres yeah. outside Kmart. Kmart. Who wow. wants, wow, the first thing I'll do out of lockdown is oh, go to like Kmart. Kmart right? Right. But that tells you people wanted to get out and mix with people and go shopping again. Yeah. And, and, yeah, we buy things online and it's great. I'd buy lots of stuff online. There's no issue. Mm. But I also like to get out and go for one or touch things and, and, and look at them before I buy. And I've got a, one of my uh, young blokes who works with me, his girlfriend, and this, uh, they used to say people are going to go into shops, look, try the thing on, then go online and buy it. Well, it's exactly the opposite. The girlfriend buys three sizes, one above, one what she thinks, and one below of jeans or dresses or whatever. And they get mailed to her because the idiots who set up digital marketing didn't understand direct. You never give free tr- free delivery. That's mm. insane. I'll get to that in a minute. So because of free delivery, she gets all the goods sent to her. She tries them on, sends them all back, and then goes to the store where her loyalty card is to buy the pair that fitted. Mm. So they're using the free delivery, and, for, and Zara's now announced they can no longer afford free delivery or returns because it's 20% of their cost. Wow. Right? And if you go back to mail order, which is what, you know, remote shopping is not new. Sears was selling homes by mail order catalogue in the 1800s. Mm. Right? You buy a home from a catalogue, right? Wow. And it'd be really? Del- yeah, and it would be built, you know, and like, yeah. They were drop shipping, and Sears was an online, was a mail order business for 40 years before it opened up a retail store. So it was a remote drop shipping company 150 years ago. I didn't right? even know it was that old. So yeah, so it started 18, 1872, I think it was. Yeah. So anyway, so what you've got is the um, the shipping in mail order was always a profit center. It was called postage and handling, mm. and you cut a deal with your delivery company. Yeah. So you would pay a bulk rate, but you charge the customer the, the retail rate. Clip the tickets. And they, and they were happy. Customers were happy. They knew I'm buying it, I'm getting a deal, and I'm happy to pay freight because it's coming to my home. Mm-hmm. What did the digital doofuses do? Oh, let's give free shipping, and straight away their margins got screwed. Yeah. Right? And so now they're like, oh, how do we survive because we can't afford free shipping now because we're getting screwed by the consumers on free shipping. Mm. So a lot of them are backing out of free shipping because it's costing them too much money because no one studied history. They thought they are onto something new because the technology was new. But the way of buying remotely has been around well over 100 years. We've got bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> so you said... Um, oh, I've completely lost my train of thought. So sorry. So what we're seeing now is actually just history repeated, yeah. but with new mediums. Yeah, exactly. It's so just new channels. Yeah. Is there any data around comparing the US to Australia around what people are buying online? Because I get the sense... And I'm like you, I'm, I'm quite tactile as a person and, and I, I like the experience. Yep. I think the Americans are great at an experience, at, at a shopping mm. experience. You know, you go to Disney. Oh, the retail like, stores it, are amazing. They're, yeah. they're great at the experience. So it would be really interesting to see what people are buying online in the US. Um, but also, is it more transactional where it's the easy stuff, where it can be easily replaced or mm. it's, it's, there's a price point? Um do you know I, I don't mean? have the evidence on it, but I did a at this time last week. I was working with some Amazon entrepreneurs doing a, a podcast and um, a podcast at a webinar, and, and they their problem is they're selling whatever's trending on Amazon, right? So one person there was selling binoculars, another one was selling garden manure, right? Mm. Literally branding their own version, and and they deliver it to the Amazon warehouse. They run the ads on Amazon and hope people buy from them rather than someone else. He's selling shit. 
selling shit. But How long does it have to be trending and, before they go, well, we'll make our own? The, the software picks it up and they, exactly, I'm like, wow. Anyway, what's interesting is if you do it that way and it's called fulfilment by Amazon, they get none of the customer data. Amazon oh. gets it. So they're constantly having to top the bucket up yeah. because they don't know who the customers are. So they've got to – the reason they rush to doing it themselves is so on the packaging they can try and capture data, like yeah, yeah. scan this code, opt in, you know, blah, blah, blah. But America is slightly different to us in that, in that more than half of America has an Amazon account. And when Amazon launched Amazon Prime, which was nothing like what it is now, um, it suits Americans because so much of what they buy comes from Amazon, but it's the commodity products. It's the toilet paper. It's the – you know, the, the standard groceries. The batch, batteries are one of the biggest sellers on Amazon. Mm. Uh, I actually have a mate who plays this game up in Brisbane and he sits up at night with his software trending and last year, the year before last, his largest selling product that he drop shipped was beard oil for hipsters. Beard oil. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> so, That's niche. And so what he would do That's was <laughs> he would find what was, what was trending and he would open up an eBay store or an Etsy store and sell it. And people would pay him for it. Then he'd go and buy it on Amazon because he'd mark it up, right? Mm. That's just arbitrage. And Amazon would then fulfil it for him. The only issue is if someone wants to return it, it's got to go back that way. It's a bit of a problem. Mm. But there's a whole industry of people sitting at home doing nothing but playing arbitrage using SEO and software. It could be light bulbs. It could be binoculars. It could be beard oil, you know. So it has created an industry. You've, you've got to work hard at it. Like, you've got to then value, well, what's my time worth per hour? Mm. Um, but there's some people make a lot of money out of it, and there's others who are, you know, like anything, 10% are doing well and the rest never will. Mm. Um, so to your answer, I think America is slightly different to us. They're much more attuned to buying stuff online. It's also a much bigger economy. Mm. Uh, here we have the distance problem of yep. delivery and the cost of delivery in this country and the labour cost. Yeah. Uh, so, so we don't follow like American trends or something like that. If they start doing a marketing a certain way, then we will start. Doing uh, yes, it. we do. We do. Yeah, 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 yeah. We we tend to follow the Yanks. The Yanks tend to lead the world in marketing. The UK might argue that, yeah, um, yeah. but uh, <laughs> the, no, the the uh, America has always been. Uh, yeah, they invented it. And, yeah, uh, and because of they're the largest economy in the world, mm. whatever works well there picks up quickly. So yeah. the rest of the world follows. And if you look at all the traditional marketing books, they came out of America. Okay. You know. um, have you seen the consumer become more of the product over the years? It, you're, it's really interesting. I've got an, a thought on this and I think that uh, uh, the internet is going to devalue some brands because people are just going to buy commodities mm. and that's why there's a – I think I, I may be wrong on this, but I'm sure there's an Amazon-branded battery that sells better than the others. And this is the problem is what Amazon do is they see what's trending – then they open up their own business around it. So the poor entrepreneurs who built their business on Amazon die immediately mm. because Amazon have got a competitive product that's cheaper. I, yeah. I don't the don't quote me on this, anyone, but I think the iconic do that as well, don't they? If they see that, like, say, white chinos for men are going really, really well, they'll they'll kind of build their own brand around. Yeah, them. a lot of them do that. So this is where data does work if you're tracking it right. But uh, it makes it, what has happened is with so many channels opening it up. It's the cost of business has, has increased rapidly, even though the internet's cheaper. Mm. You, if you don't have a social channel, Google doesn't look at you because they own YouTube. Mm. You know? um, and if your social channel isn't used regularly, it, it, you get penalised. So suddenly you've got to open up social channels. So this is why this thing around content marketing has taken off, which is quite funny because you've had this exponential growth in publishing, yet there's still only 24 hours in the day. So we're still doing what we did, right? And, you know, we're creating content here tonight and you're building an audience. But, but what you've got to do is build an audience, mm. right? But so many of these organisations now are publishing content for content's sake purely to keep Google happy and SEO happy. Mm. And most of it's never seen or read because, you know, we still have to sleep, we've got to eat, you know, we've got to have sex, we've got to go out, got to shop, got to do what we do. Mm. Where's the – what are you going to give up? to consume this infobesity of content that's out there. Most of it written by typists, not copywriters. Yeah. In infobesity. Yeah, that's a, not, that's is, a that, cool one. is that yours? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But seriously, is that, I've yeah. never heard of that before. Yeah, I call it infobesity. Um, and it is. We've got this plethora of crap coming at us. And coming back to that point before about the quality, 
it's been typed. But once again, you don't need to be a marketer. Well, it's like, oh, you can type, therefore I'm a copywriter. You know, like it's – it's you can hit a keyboard, you can write. No. Mm. And, and that's why there's so much of what you see is utter crap mm. because it's written by people who are typists, not trained copywriters. So what have been – well, this is a double prong question here now. What's been some of the good stuff that you've seen yeah. for to help the companies? And then what's been some of the bad things that you've seen that the companies? But then conversely, what's been some of the good stuff for us, the consumers? And then the bad stuff for okay. us. The, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think if I take what I think one of the best things we've invented, and the argument is it was Seller Masters in Australia that was the first to do it, is. People who bought that also bought this. Or people who looked mm. at that also. So it's just like a shop assistant would say, oh, I see you're trying that shirt. Would you like to try this shirt? You know, like that was one of the really good things that said yeah, because of that, and this is where a good use of data, you might be interested in buying these, you know. Um, so from a consumer point of view, that has been quite helpful. Uh, and, and Sorry, from a business point of view because it's, it's an upsell, you know, without trying too hard. Mm. Um, so that, that's, you know, to that point, it's been really good. Um, the speed with which you can find things, obviously, you know, or which mm. you can then reach people. Uh, you know, digital has allowed you to reach a lot of people very quickly. The problem is everyone's doing it, so it's just getting harder to, to break through. It's yeah. just become a noisy channel. And and, ad, and it has to be advertising-driven or subscription-driven. You know, advertising is the oil of the economy. It, it's Without advertising, businesses go broke. Mm. You know, that, like you've got, sorry, media channels go broke. So a, a social media can't exist unless they pay a subscription or they have advertising. Mm. And then people say, but I don't want this free service <laughs> yeah. being interrupted by advertising. Well, will you pay for it? No. Yeah, I pay for YouTube just yeah. so I don't have the ad. ad yeah, 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 right. So YouTube have got the premium channel, yeah. you know. Is that YouTube or Red Tube you were paying for? Oh, both. I've both. got a I subscription. Yeah, right. both. Okay. I've got a bundle yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually a content creator on both channels. <laughs> Well, it's just a dark room by myself. But anyway, mm. we'll get into that later. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. I'd what about Instagram? Instagram now is just like every – you scroll the feed and it's just one someone who you don't even know, ad. Someone you don't even know, ad. It's just constantly ads. I'd rather pay for Instagram now so I don't have to have that. That's interesting. I uh, coined another term. It's called your ass time, right? Mm. It's your average social screen time. Mm. And for most, it's less than a second for one image on Insta, for yeah. example. Um, Digivise is a really good company in Australia that, that links, that tracks all your social media but also um, Google AdWords and gives you reports. They uh, reckon we, we currently scroll 110 metres a day on our phone. And Facebook have a thing, or Meta, whatever they call themselves, they call it the Eiffel Tower. They reckon we scroll three Eiffel Towers a day, right, in height. You know, that's the... So, to your point... That's massive. When you're scrolling that quickly, the ad has to be bloody good if you're going to stop and use it. Yeah. But the problem is it's so cheap. That's why no one cares whether the ads are good or not because they only need one or two to, to work, to pay only one or two responses and yeah. the ad has worked. They don't think about how many people like you they're pissing off. Mm. But Instagram won't survive without advertising. And, yeah. you know, if you look at when iPhone last year said, okay, you have to opt in now to receive Facebook ads, yeah. right? Zuckerberg lost $10 billion in advertising in the first quarter. Yeah. Okay. The only people who've opted into Facebook's staff, you know, no one else has said, yes, send me ads, you know. Yeah. So it's less than 5% of people who own iPhones have opted in for ads. Wow. Um, so from Facebook. So this is what these walled gardens are becoming because Apple want to own the, own the space and sell advertising in it. Facebook, you know, depends on the devices. So uh, it's why Google was smart and got into devices. Uh, because, you know, they've got a phone, they can do things. But the problem there is, uh, coming back to some negatives, I've seen experiences where a mate of mine was typing an email in Gmail to a friend about lunch, and as he started to type about you want to meet for lunch, ads popped up about from local restaurants in the email, above the email. Oh, right? That's too far. And it's the same, um, you can put an iPhone down and... It's listening. Yeah, and it's listening because Siri has to listen. And I remember a little experiment friends of mine did. They they closed the boardroom door because no one believed it and they put all their iPhones on the table and they went, North American real estate, North American real estate. Within 24 hours there were ads for apartments in America on all their phones Yeah, right? because Siri was listening. Yeah. And that's the bad side of it is that you can be – I'll be talking about something in class about a brand ad – and then I'll go onto my social while the students are doing something, and sure enough, there's the ad in a, in a social feed. Yeah, like within a few minutes. So it's funny. 
LG just did an update to their TV screen literally a few days ago. And um, because I'm so aware of cookies and voice listening and everything like that, I went through and I read all of the terms and conditions that you had to now action. And I read oh, yeah. them all. And I'm lo- and it's like, it was the voice recognition one because I use the voice recognition on your to, mob, on your to talk to the screen remote, so I can, yeah. um, you know, search YouTube or RedTube, whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> when the missus is out. Um, uh, or when the cat's just watching me. <laughs> no. Um, and I, I went through and I read the terms and conditions and it said that it, the microphone will be on all the mm. time. It will be used for advertisement and everything. Mm. And if I don't click that, I can't use any of the microphone features now. So you literally have to go through. And I tried just clicking, you know, just one of them and then not clicking the rest. And then half of the features on the on the TV didn't work anymore. Yeah. yeah. And I was absolutely... Like, and that's where it's wrong. So annoying. That coming back to your... I didn't finish the whole positive negative. That's one of the negative experiences is because they can, they're screwing you on that. You know, I, I went to... Um, I, was, I had to vote for something today, but to do that I had to allow an activation and I'm trying to vote for a mate of mine who wanted something done and I had to turn something on that I never wanted to turn on, mm. otherwise I couldn't use it. You know, and then I had to go back in and turn it off afterwards, mm. you know, just to get it in. And They're the things that they don't understand the negative side of that. Mm. And, you know, pre-internet, we didn't need all that to talk to people. You know, if you've got, if you've got a person's name, their address, their phone number, their email address, you can do business with them if they're a customer. Right, prospects are different. You've still got to attract prospects, but you don't need all that other stuff to get most of what you need done. Mm. And yeah, it's nice to have, and it's great to build a personality through social media, and you can build your brand and social proof. There's I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. What is wrong if it's just this digital focus? You need to be considering all the other media, and and still the most trusted media is print. Second is TV and radio, and outdoor, and third is direct mail. Um, in terms but of surely media that's channels. dying though. That, that's changing those things. No? no, it's still. I mean, even Streamy of the World Cup. Yes, it's the biggest stream, and it was one percent of viewers streamed the World Cup. You know, the rest are on a big screen in a pub yeah, or at yeah. home, yeah, for sure. looking at it. You know, uh, sure, we now and then we look at it on our phone, but you watch it on the big screen. That's still part of the experience. Yeah. What is changing though, if I can indulge for a minute, is and I've got a, I've got an eighteen and a nineteen year old, right. Mm. They've hardly ever sat with us on a couch and watched a big screen, right? They look at YouTube every day. Yeah. They sit there on YouTube and now TikTok. Yeah. Oh, My son can't come to the table downstairs without the phone in his hand and we're sitting there. You know, we I drop him to work. It's only five minutes and he's got the phone in his hand scrolling TikTok mm-hmm. or something. So you've got this – we'll look back going, what the hell are we thinking, you know? Science yeah. will prove that. But you've got a generation now where they're not just looking at one screen. So let's say they're looking at YouTube on their laptop or mm-hmm. their iThing. They've also got their mobile going yeah. and they're texting their mates or they're Snapchatting their mates or whatever it might be. Yeah. And they've nearly always got two devices going uh, and they use them for different purposes. But they're not necessarily sitting looking at a big screen unless that's in their bedroom. You yeah. know, they, they, that whole thing of the it's family sits around yeah. has disappeared. So to your point about, yes, trusted media, the, the screen is still a trusted media and streaming is now the big issue for advertisers because mm. if you're paying a subscription fee with no ads – then how do, how do they reach you? Yeah. you know? And that's why the argument can come back that, well, if they know your mail address and your email address, then there's a way to reach you. Yeah. you know? um, because it is getting harder to do mass media advertising when people are streaming um, subscription services without ads. So we're in the middle of a change now? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you, we a media plan... Sorry to bore people about this. A media plan used to be a spreadsheet that showed down on the vertical column... The media, the radio you were going on, or the TV you're going on, the newspaper, and then across the timeline was how many spots per day or per month mm. over the campaign. It was spread. Now, what you've got is you've got this sort of ecosystem of circles that have got. Okay, we're going to start with a social media activation. That's going to link to user generated content. That's going to drive to website. TV advertising is going to come in over here, and it's going to do this role. And you've got because the aim is to get shared. So you've got owned, earned and paid media. Paid media means advertising. Owned are all your own assets. Earned is what people are talking about, and that's traditional public relations, but it's also what the public's saying in social media. Earned. And then just sharing, getting it shared, even if it's a paid media, getting it shared. So what you're trying to do is get as much exposure as you can across all the different channels mm. because it's just getting harder to reach through single channels. Um, you said owned... And and paid media, yeah, yeah, and shared is what you're trying to get them all done. Shared, 
So one of the guys I, I like to watch, um, I think we mentioned this at lunch with the, the Gruen show, um, and, and I like Todd Sampson. Um, watch a lot of his docos, and I think he's quite an interesting cat. Yeah. Just because I think he's been on that agency side, and now I think he's kind of going on this journey. Yeah, he's um, changed completely, yeah, and from what I can tell. And, and so <coughs> where do you sit on that? Like, again, you said you've got an 18, 19-year-old. You're obviously fully across all the mediums. Yeah, you again, I don't want to talk too much for the tenure in the industry, but it's quite important Yeah, because you've, you've been there, done it. Yeah. Are, are you concerned about, again, your, your son sitting watching YouTube on one screen, then the phone in the other yeah. screen, and then... You know, maybe I, I'm more concerned about the technology than the content, actually. Right, okay. Because, you know, this whole dopamine effect of notification. I, I ask my students, I say, and they're all under 22, right? Yeah. And I say, what's the first thing you do in the morning? And they all go, look at our phones, Check right? Phone, yeah. um, and it's funny, they call them phones, but, oh, no, we don't call anyone. Phoning purpose of people, you know, that's breaching privacy. I'll yeah. Talk, yeah. talk about that. I don't that. want to talk to anyone. We'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. yeah. You actually... How, how dare you walk up and talk to me in the office? You need to email me first to say you're coming. You know? um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or or if you call, it's seen as a breach of privacy because you're saying your time's more important than theirs. You need to text first to say you're calling. Right? This is a whole new right? other, This is a whole anyway, new episode. Anyway, but when I when <laughs> I say to my students, what's the first thing you do? They say, well, look at our phones. I say, okay, but where do you go first? And everyone would say, oh, I bet you those kids go to Insta, you know, or TikTok, say and it's. Yes, yeah. Uh, well, that's that's, that's TikTok. No, um, no. What drives them is notifications. How far behind the social curve am I? So the one with the most notifications is the thing they've missed the most of. I have to get onto that quickly to see like what I've missed out on. So if Insta's got more notifications than Facebook, they'll go to Insta first. So they look at the notifications and go, "Shit, what have I missed most?" Oh, that one. So they don't necessarily go straight to a channel because they've got so many channels. They go where they're behind the social curve to catch up and then they go to the next channel and catch up and they clear the notifications process. And that's just, once again, that old dopamine thing of mm. you know, to, to checking you. Surely that would increase... Um, surely that would just have like this kind of compounding effect of like micro-stress almost. Yes, absolutely because it is. before they've even got out of bed and brushed mm. their teeth and looked themselves in the mirror, yeah. yep. they're... They're, they would be they're stressed, comparing they're, themselves to they're, the, they're look at that person and look at their social life or look how beautiful they are or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and, it and is. that's before they even left. Then they get to yep. work and then they've probably got an inbox full of emails. Then they might get a grilling from the boss or they might get. So that that's just setting the. Day it's up. frightening. Yeah, off, absolutely. Off the charts wrong. And that's got nothing to do with advertising. That's why I said I'm more concerned about the technology right. and what's going on. I mean, you think about it. Zuckerberg created Facebook as a hate site for women, right? He wasn't getting laid at college, so he set up a site where the boys rated the women by putting their faces on a ratings thing, and it took off. That's the guy running Facebook, right? Yeah, you know, th that's the small mind. And th so you've now got this, this social media – and social's got so many – I mean, I've got such good contact with friends overseas like everyone has. You know, yeah. we've, uh, there's such good positives about it, yeah, but the problem is there's so much negative. I mean, look at what Elon's going to do now with Twitter. I mean, he thinks the advertisers – he thinks the advertisers are going to save his pay off his forty four billion. I reckon they're all going to bail. His Twitter will be lucky to survive. With a check mark, you reckon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'd, well, funny thing is, I didn't even know there was a check mark until he told me about it. Yeah. Most people I have who've got accounts don't have one. Yeah. Um, because it was so badly marketed. Um, but you know, if he lets hate speech back in on under freedom of press, advertisers aren't going to be there because they don't. Because this is the problem. They're now let, they've let programmatic advertising is where computers do the advertising based on what it tells you. I want to reach a 40-year-old male wine lover. Well, these guys are 40-year-old and they've been on this site and this site and this site, so we'll place ads. And suddenly your ads are sitting next to a white supremacist site or you know, a porn site or something, so you don't know where they are. And, or you don't know what hate speech it's going to be next to on Twitter. So yeah. the advertising going to go, we're pulling out. It's, it's mainly to combat bots. Yeah. You know, it's to get rid of all of the bullshit on Twitter as well. You know, that's why the eight dollar subscription. It's only for blue check mark. If you're a verified account and you want a blue check mm. mark, then it's eight dollars. It's still free to yeah. Uh, for yeah, yeah. to use. Yes. Um, and I don't think freedom of speech should be suppressed. Um, now, yeah, if you say something that is, you know, derogatory or hate speech or something like that, obviously there should be punishment for that. But suppressing what people say, I agree, um, yeah. is I'm not a big fan of. I don't think you should, but no. the issue you've got is advertisers want brand security. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And because computers, not humans, are placing the ads, 
they can't trust the network and that's why they walk away. It's not yeah. to do with free speech or anything. It's that they don't know where their ads are going to appear because, and this is it, you ask any chief marketing officer where have your ads appeared online, they can't tell you. But where are they going to go? Parlour, True, so- True Social, like oh, I have Twitter no, is Twitter. I have no idea. You know, yeah. they may just not, I'll just stick with other channels, they may just not be with Twitter yeah. um, unless for some reason they've got evidence it's really the core channel that's delivering the most new business or mm. new sales or something. I mean, it's very much an echo chamber of left and right, you mm. know, depending on where you sit. It is, definitely. So <laughs> it's just, yeah. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it will be interesting to see where that goes. But this is where, with all these walled gardens, as I said earlier, you know, with third-party cookies disappearing, hopefully, Google's delayed it again, it means you've got to try and deal direct with publishers, and that's a better thing to do rather than programmatic. Mm. And the other thing with programmatic, for every dollar you spend, only six cents goes to the publisher. The rest gets lost in all this data bullshit of mm. supposed targeting. Well, if you know the publisher and who they who reads it, you just go to the publisher and the dollar would be spent. Mm. For, you know, you get better value on a dollar. Uh, that's the other thing: is the the return on investment in there is is not good as a percentage. It's just that it's so cheap, people keep doing it. Mm. You know, if you had to spend it at the same rate in traditional media, you'd, you'd go broke straight away. Mm. So on that, I think that's probably a nice segue to your direct marketing book so you said you meant you wrote one 20 years ago yeah um you've got one now direct mail the real digital disruptor why come back to it why yeah look, I, I wrote direct marketing which is a, sort of a way of marketing so it's direct response television and other things mail i've written on email and a couple of things what happened was about three years ago financial services company because they're the, the big users of mail mm-hmm. originally um asked a mate of mine who runs a mail house we need help with direct mail because no one in the agency has any experience they're all too young and they've just never done it and digital stopped paying for itself we've maxed out what we can spend there's no marginal return on what we're getting we're getting stuff but we can't increase it so he came to me because i you know i used to aussie post used to they bought thousands of my books put their logo on it and, and paid me to travel around the country training businesses on it and because i ran the biggest direct marketing agency in australia as well so there's some credibility so what happened was I did this seminar on direct mail and we produced a small version of the book and Fuji Xerox was the sponsor and they have the big digital presses that personalise print. So we personalised the cover you know, and gave all the delegates a copy. And I sort of was scratching at the surface so I did a bit of research and discovered how fast it was growing. Like if you take America, um, and this is where it's different to Australia, if you visit a website in America, your ISP address can be matched to your home address. And they can geofence your home and advertise into every device in that home. Wow. All right? So now you take remarketing around the web. Because it's got so expensive, because there's, such, there's so little good quality real estate now, digital real estate, it used to cost half a penny per impression. Now it's north of three cents, and it's at least 50 impressions. So it costs $1.50 to 5 bucks to chase someone around the web on impressions. If you pay per click, it's much more. Well, mail's cheaper than that. So the, the irony is that mail, which was seen as expensive, is now cheaper than digital marketing. Mm. What they're doing in the States is two things. If you visit the site, within 12 hours, a postcard can be mailed to you with a QR code linking to a landing page based on what you visited, and they'll chase you around the web. But the, the postcard, the physical tactile thing, is what drives the sale. The phone becomes the order device. Mm. The other thing is they're using outbound using direct mail like it used to be with postcards. So the big growth is postcards. I mean, I, there's one company I spoke to who have 300 employees. They do over a quarter of a billion postcards a year. Right? There's another guy I met, nothing but automotive postcards. Another one, nothing but real estate postcards. And that's his life. Mm. Um, I, I interviewed four different postcard companies, all doing hundreds of millions of postcards a year. And it's a booming industry. The one guy's business has grown 40% year on year the last three years. So you inter- the best thing, I'm not saying one or the other, you integrate it. So the card goes out, then it's supported with in-app advertising or social media advertising as reminders. And eventually it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll put that card there, let me go back to it, scan, you know, yeah. buy or download or whatever it might be. So I'm seeing mail is now growing. It's also growing in the UK. So in the UK, Royal Mail are paying £3 per thousand of postage to have a panel just as you've got a panel that tracks TV or radio and everything. So they scan, they photograph every piece of mail that comes through their door unaddressed or addressed and then record what they do with it. So media buyers can now 
look at mail as a media channel in the same way as they look at other media and include it. So it's coming back into its own as a media channel. So I thought, I did all that research and thought, you know what, there's an opportunity here. And the reason I called it real is because it's tactile, you know. Mm. Um, and also, when I first wrote my email book about 20 years ago, I was invited to do a debate at the Direct Marketing Conference. And I was the email and we were versing Australia Post. So real versus virtual, mm. right? And email had just taken off, it was sexy. We, we were nailing Aussie, but we had the debate one and then the final whips come up to do the one-minute summary. Mm. And the lady I know very often, Aussie Post, she got up there and she said, well, all I've got to say is this. And she pulled out a lipstick, painted her lips and said, would you rather a real kiss or a virtual kiss? And we lost the debate. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> she just puck it up to the audience, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. That's a drop of mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so all I thought was I'm learning something here, which, you know, you, you like to keep doing that. So I thought I'll do a Stephen Bradbury, you know, come from behind um, and say, hey, we'll, we're talking about how you integrate mail. And there's a whole generation that doesn't know how to do that. We're not saying mail's better than. Mm. We're just saying when you work the two together, you get a bit of result all over. But there's a generation who don't know that, so we've got to try and convince them. And so I wrote the book. Um, interestingly, we're getting some – there's quite a bit of resistance for CMOs to admit that maybe they – because they don't know that, they don't want to admit they don't know it. There's an ego thing stepping in here. So we've got to bring them along with us to say, we're not here to prove you wrong. We're here to say, why don't you jump on this like you jumped on the shiny digital objects and you'll do even better, right? If it was called, you know, direct mail shiny digital, then they might <laughs> – they might respond and, and can you, would you say that direct mail is um, appropriate for, for more product-based businesses or service-based businesses, or is it agnostic? Look, it's agnostic, and once again, it's a cost. Um, you, and that's why I said it's the art of losing money in very small amount. You test and learn to see if it does work and it doesn't. It suits uh, high-repeat purchase, uh, but not high-repeat without thinking like toilet paper, you know, although funny enough... I buy who gives a crap online. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they've got a very cool CSR yeah, story Exactly, as well, that's so right. It's quite yeah. a bit. But, but, you know, you've got your routines where you go to the supermarket and buy stuff or go online and buy it from the supermarket. But if you're buying wine regularly, mail's perfect for it, you know. Um, it's, you know it's that sort of thing. If you're buying pet food, um, sanitary protection, perfect. Every month, you know, here's, it's, an, it's called the negative option. We'll keep sending it to you until you say no. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like book clubs... You know, the record clubs, which became CD clubs, nothing, vitamin clubs, nothing. You, you remember the old um, spice, you could buy spices on um, remotely. And the first thing you oh, got, really? for, well, you got, the, you'd buy spices, and the first thing you'd get would be rack. the spice rack yeah. that takes 24 spices. Well, if you only bought one bottle of spice, what are you going to do? You're going <laughs> to fill the rack, and every month, here's your next offer, right? It's not, they used to give you the record holder for the records, yeah. right? I looked at that, I never <laughs> had the time. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, mate. It's but, a nice joke. Yeah, yeah, I get it. But <laughs> anyone else find that funny? <laughs> no, <laughs> just me. Jeez, tough crowd. Tough crowd. So, uh, so I wrote it to try and educate a new generation. Whether it'll work or not, we'll see. Um, but certainly, it's the book's getting some great reviews, which I like. Uh, and you know, I, I I like doing my training, so I'm seeing trying to use it as a way to come in and train teams on on what's going on. Uh, what did your class say? So when you when you've kind of launched this with your class, because you said they're kind of in their twenty year old, what, what, um, were they like? Oh. Well, <coughs> one of the rules when you teach uni is you can't flog your own stuff to your students. So um, can you talk about? I just the theory I, yeah, I did. I did talk brief, and a lot of them are connected to me on LinkedIn, so they'd seen it. People were getting their book and photographing it and showing it, and most of them were like, "What's direct mail?" They didn't. Mm. They just they didn't know. And I was explaining to them. I said, "Well." Would you rather grandma sent you a card with $200 cash or a text, you know, and, and some something in your bank account? And most of them sort of got it then, you know. Um, and I said, when you were a kid, what did your parents do with the artwork you bought home? Did they stick it on the fridge, you know? <laughs> mm. And I said, there is a and, – and here's the interesting thing. I haven't yet one, had one student who wants their degree given to them via their Apple Watch – they all want a piece of paper and they photograph themselves holding the piece of paper in front of the university saying, look, I've graduated, and they yeah. put it on their wall. Yeah. That's know. a great analogy. Yeah. And that's how, I, that's how I sold it to them. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. 
Um, mate, what keeps you in marketing? I'm a mortgage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and two kids. And two yeah, kids yeah, yeah. who are at private school. Yeah, um, <laughs> look, I like it. Uh, and look, I've always... I got very early into training because when I was young, I got a good break from a boss. But when I was early in direct marketing, no one knew much about it. So I invested heavily in training our team young and uh, I started to like training and then I wrote courses for the direct marketing station and delivered those and I've, I set up my own marketing education business. So as you can tell, I hate, to, I hate a conversation, so I'm happy to teach. <laughs> and I started to write as well. And... Uh, you know, I, I like doing that. It's I'm probably a bit past the daily grind of servicing clients day in, day out, that sort of thing. But if I can manage a team that does that or ma- mentor a team that does that and, and keep my writing up because I do my blog, uh, then, you know, and do some, the public speaking, the training, then that's what I really like, you know. And it's nice to see the, the light bulb go on. It's like the students, you know. we I teach the capstone subject in... It's, it's social sciences, it's not business <laughs> studies. But we bring the majors from advertising, PR and social and digital together and we four create mini agencies and we get clients to give them briefs. So the clients get seven or eight agencies pitching. Mm. And when you see the ideas, it's like, wow, you know, there's hope for the future here. <laughs> 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 you know, we've got some really talented people. I mean, they tend to default to TikTok. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine, but let's think about bigger things yeah, here, yeah. you know. But then again, some of the stuff they come up with TikTok is bloody brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you know, so... It, 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 when they're trained in what I would say the traditional way and they get to understand research, insights, strategy, big ideas, propositions, you see better quality work and it comes out across the different media. So I do like seeing the young people do well. So with what you just said, are the five Ps of marketing still true and real today? Yeah, look, the, there's all sorts of arguments about that and, and what, this is one of the problems with social is just like arseholes, everyone's got an opinion, you know. Um, it's we've all got one, one, we've all got both. And to stand out, you can't stand out by saying, you know what, I agree with everything, so I'm not going to be controversial. Mm. <laughs> so to stand out, you've got to go. Oh, the world's changed, you know. Henny penny, the sky's falling, and this is what digital did. Um, so yeah, look, pricing, product promotion, um, positioning, uh, distribution—they're all still applicable. But I think what has changed, that is that if you look at the definition of real marketing, it's supposed to be about inventing the products or services, coming up with the pricing, the distribution strategy, and doing the, the promotion. What marketing has become is really just marcoms, marketing, communicate, and promotion. Someone else is doing the distribution. Someone else is doing the innovation and the new product development. It's actually not falling under the marketing remit. I mean, they've even got stupid job titles now, like customer officer, separate to the marketing officer. Like... Why would that be? Because marketing is all about customers, you know, but they're actually doing this sort of thing and they're pulling it apart. So marketing is becoming Marcoms, which is marketing communications, which is advertising traditionally. Mm. Um, so marketing these days is more about the promotion side, uh, marketing departments. Marketing is still about getting the product right, getting the distribution strategy right, um, you know, and, and those traditional P's. Awesome, mate. Malcolm, as you quite eloquently put it, you do love a conversation. Um, I have loved this conversation. I mm. hope you have as well, buddy. Yeah, I've, mate, this has been fascinating, actually. This is mm. so far away from your world. Yeah, which is cool. No, I'm really, I've really enjoyed it. I've actually thought about my marketing manager the whole time, actually. <laughs> yeah, I want to know where you can get that book because um, I'm going to get him a I'm copy. I'm sure I can organise one. Yeah. yeah, I know the author. Yeah, <laughs> no, so thanks, mate. <laughs> Mate, if people want to get hold of you, um, how do they have a conversation with you? Uh, well, you can go to my website, which is malcolmalldirect.com.au or email me, in, uh, send it to inquiry, I-N-Q-U-I-R-Y, at madmail, M-A-D-M-A-I-L.com.au. Awesome. And we'll, awesome. Put, we'll put that on, uh, on, the, on the show notes as well. Yeah, yeah. sure. Thanks really for having me. It's been great. Thanks really enjoyed it. Awesome. Mate, thank you for coming on Lifestyle Pirates. We shall see you again Cheers. next week. Yeah, Cheers. Right. Thank you. Yeah.